Uh, just as a reminder, uh, we have seen the trumpets now continue to be blown, and we've seen the wrath that has come with these trumpets. Uh, we just concluded the sixth trumpet, and now we move to the interlude. You will remember that what we had in, um, in the seals was an interlude between the 6th and the 7th. We're going to have the same thing, an interlude between the 6th and the 7th of the blowing of the trumpets. This time, though, instead of one interlude, we've got two interludes that, that kind of uh, fall into four different pictures. And so what I want to do tonight is read these separately. Uh, one, because it keeps me from having to read two chapters all at once. But we're going to look at each picture individually, uh, starting with... Chapter 10 will be in verses 1 through 7. So if you've got your Bible, I encourage you to open it up. If you're uh, following along online, I encourage you to do so as well. Um, Starting in verse 1 of chapter 10, John writes, he says, Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. And his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. And when he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said. And do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and was in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there be no more delay. But that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. So we're dividing up this, these two chapters, this interlude, into four different pictures. The first interlude is the story of a mighty angel with a little scroll, um, but our first picture is really not so much of the scroll, but more of the angel and the seven thunders. And so uh, the first interlude divided into two pictures. You have the angel and the seven thunders, and then you have the little scroll, or some may translate it as a little book. And so what's, what's going on here? Well, we've just seen the judgments that are coming down. And I think verse uh, 20 of chapter 9 are important to remember where it says the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues. This is a summary of, to me, of all, not just the sixth trumpet, but of all the trumpets. It says the rest of them who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood which cannot see or hear or, hear or walk nor did they repent of their murderers or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thie- thie- thefts. Sorry. Then he moves into this interlude, this, this vision. And he gets a vision of another mighty angel. Now, there are several aspects of this angel that should remind us of Christ. But I want to be clear, I do not believe this angel is Christ. But But it seems clear that John is giving this angel some of the imagery of Christ in order to to show us that he has the authority of Christ. So I believe if it was Christ, he wouldn't say another mighty angel. Um, We have a a mighty angel in chapter 5, verse 2. Now here we have another mighty angel um, in chapter 10, verse 1. So that's why I don't think it's Christ. He's referring to just another strong angel. But he says this angel's coming down from heaven, So where does this angel's authority derive from? He's coming down from heaven, so his authority is deriving from heaven. But look at how this angel is described. Wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head, his face was like the sun, his legs like pillars of fire. 
You go back to chapter one and you see John's first image of, of Christ and you see some very similar uh, language. You know, uh, feet like burnished bronze. You have uh, the face like the sun. So clearly John is trying to give us an image of this angel carrying the authority of Christ. It is not Christ, but he certainly carries the authority of Christ. He has got the face like the sun, similar to chapter one, I believe it's around verse 16 or so, where we have that description of Christ. He's then described as having a little open scroll in his hand. Well, the fact that the scroll is open means we're gonna, we're gonna know what's in it, we're gonna, that, that its contents will be revealed, but we don't get to find that out until a little bit later. There's a little bit more going on here. He says, so he has a little open scroll in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land. So this is an angel who is standing on the land and standing on the sea. Uh, I believe that represents the totality of the earth, his authority over the totality of the earth. But I also believe that John is probably alluding to the fact with this person carrying the authority, this angel carrying the authority of Christ, we're going to read a little bit later on about a beast who comes from the land and a beast who comes from the sea. And I believe John is letting us know before we even know about the beast of the land and beast of the sea that Christ has authority over the land and the sea. And so to me, this is another picture of the authority of Christ that's being represented here. So he says, when he call, or, or, and he called out with a loud voice, like a lion roaring. I mean, that's, that's the sound of authority. That's the sound that says, uh, pay attention to what's about to happen here. And when he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And John says, I was about to write down because what was John told to do? Write what you see and hear. So John, John's just trying to be obedient to, to what, uh, what he's called to do. And he says, I was about to write down but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it and earth is what, and what is in it and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay. Uh, I believe the King James translates this, and time shall be no more. You know the, uh, the song when the uh, roll is called up yonder. Uh, you know, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. That's a direct quote from this text. I don't think the, uh, the King James gets the translation right, though. I think the, the ESV and uh, the NIV, very similar in this translation as well, is saying what's being announced here is not the end of time, but saying there is the delay of God's judgment is gone. There's, there will be no more delay in God's judgment. There will be no more putting off of God's judgment. And I think going back to the, the, uh, the seven thunders, I believe that you know, the, the question we have is, well, what did those thunders say? What were those thunders about? Why wouldn't John allow to write that? Why couldn't he? And I think John gives us the answer in saying, hey, the reason that I can't give you the message of the thunders is because the thunders represent a warning, in a sense. They're a, an announcement of judgment, kind of a, a warning of judgment. Hey, judgment is coming. Well, by not writing down the, the, the message of the thunders, what John is saying is there's no more warning. There's no more, uh, you know, letting you know that the storm is coming, so to speak. It's time. The time is now. There's no more delaying. And so the sound of the seven thunders, to me, represents a reminder that, that there's no more delay. God's judgment is coming. And, you know, you get this imagery, verse 6, he swears by him who lives forever, has his right hand to heaven, swears. I mean, this, if, if you go to a court, you're, you're swearing an oath. This, the, the word that he's saying is true. There is no more delay. But that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants and the prophets. And so here in this interlude, our first picture is of the angel and these seven thunders. And the seven thunders are a reminder. There will be no delay in God's judgment. Which brings us to verse 8. 
We get to verse 8, and John continues to write, and it says, And then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take and eat it. It will, take, uh, it will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. And it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and kings or and languages and kings. So here we now move to the scroll. It's already been introduced, but now the scroll takes center stage. Um, and he says, I heard a voice from heaven, spoke to me again, saying, go and take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and the land. So he says, there's a scroll of that mighty angel. Go and get the scroll from the angel. I don't know about you, but I probably would be a little intimidated if I were John. Wait a second. You want me to do what? I mean, he, he, he's a big scary guy, you know, face like the sun and legs like they're on fire, standing in the water and on the land. Um, but this is all written for the imagination. So don't get, don't get lost in, in some of the details. Read with your imagination. John is uh, the narrator right now telling us, I was told to go get the scroll. And when I went to go get the scroll, look at what it says. He said to me, take and eat it. and It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. The scroll represents... The revelation of God. We same thing that we saw with the scroll uh, of the seven seals. It's it's God's revelation to to man. And so by John getting the scroll, it's it's he's receiving a revelation from God. He's receiving a message. Now there are a couple of different theories on um, what this little scroll or little book means. Some opinions say that well, this represents a second revelation. You know, John had a, the revelation which would take us uh, up until this point and from chapter 11 on is, uh, really from chapter 12 on is the, is the second revelation. Um, they, would, they see this as, uh, you know, a, a, essentially a separate vision. When he gets this scroll, it's a separate vision. Um, others say, well, this is just uh, a representation of, of John's commission to continue to preach God's judgment. And I, I tend to fall into that category. What, what this scroll represents is God's revealing his message to John. John eating that message is his total consumption of the message of God, his giving his life to the message of God. Now, it is sweet and it is bitter. Um, and so is the message of God. I mean, if you think about the, the gospel message, it is a, a sweet message. It's a message of hope. But it's also a message of bitter judgment to those who don't know Christ and to those who do not receive Christ. And so, you know, it's, it's sweet to be able to share the message, to have a revelation from God. It's also burdensome and bitter to have to share the, the burden of God. And to say, hey, here's, here's what God says. You must repent. You must turn away. And so I think that, that this is John's message. John being told, eat the scroll, receive the message from God, and proclaim that message. It's going to be sweet, and it's going to be bitter. To those who receive the message, it's going to be sweet. It's, but it's also going to be bitter because, I mean, let's... what. A, what about those who receive the message? Let's, those who are Christians, it's a sweet message because it's a message of salvation. But it's also a bitter message because it's a message that says you're going to have to endure some hardships. As a Christian, you're going to have to endure hardships. And so it's bitter even to Christians. You know, you've got the, the uh, churches in Rome. Go back to uh, the, the seven churches that we already uh, read about. Those churches uh, in Revelation um, under the Roman oppression. They have the sweet gospel. But they have the bitterness of living in tribulation and trial because they're not of the world. 
They've not accepted Rome as their uh, kingdom. They've not pledged their allegiance to the emperor as king. And so they face the consequences, some even the consequence of death. And so the message of Christ is sweet because it's the message of salvation, but it's bitter because it's also a message of tribulation for them as well. The same is true of those who are not Christians. Uh, you know, the, the message, those who are not Christians, it, it's a message that is, that is sweet because it offers hope of the gospel. It offers hope of repentance and it offers hope of eternal life. But it's bitter because if you don't receive the message, then it condemns you to an eternity in judgment. And so John is told, you must now go consume this message and proclaim this message. And so we have the picture of this, in this first interlude, we have the picture of the angel, this mighty angel with the seven uh, thunders. We don't get to hear the message of the seven thunders because there's no more warning. The time is now. We get this picture of the little book. And it's a, mis- a, a message of, the cons- of, of consuming the revelation of God and proclaiming the, the sweet and bitter revelation of God. And then we move to chapter 11. And we get another picture. We'll start with the first two verses. It says, Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff. And I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out. For it is given over to the nations. And they will trample the holy city for 42 months. As we move into this second interlude, the first interlude being that of a vision of the the strong angel with the thunders in the book, now we have the image which, of course, is what my Bible entitles chapter 11 as the two witnesses. And let me tell you, there are all kinds of opinions about the two witnesses. Before we get to them, let's look at the measuring of the temple. Uh, The measuring of the temple is... Something that's similar to what we find in the book of Ezekiel. If you go to Ezekiel chapter 2 and 3, you're going to see a measuring of the temple. I believe that there is an allusion to that, but I don't believe that they have the same meaning. I believe that the measuring of the temple in Ezekiel it, uh, means something different than the measuring of the temple in Revelation. But I, I believe that John is bringing our Old Testament back up into our memory. We're going to see him do a lot in this uh, story of the, of the two witnesses. But what he's doing is he's, he's sending John out with a measuring rod. He says, I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God. Now, let me pause here and just give you a little bit of an interpretation note. There are some who date the book of Revelation prior to 70 A.D. Now, my scholars in the room, what happened in 70 A.D.? The temple was destroyed. Uh, So the Roman Empire, uh, Romans came in, 10th Legion of the Roman Army came in, destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. So there are some who take the measuring of the temple in Revelation 11 and say, well, Clearly, the, the, the temple had not been destroyed yet because John is told to go measure it. Um, if you have been paying attention, I date the book later than 70 AD. I date the book to the reign of Domitian probably in the 90s, uh, which means the temple has already been destroyed. Um, this is not a problem for me that John's told to go measure the temple of a temple that doesn't exist because John is not measuring the temple in Jerusalem. John is, is measuring a, an apocalyptic temple. John is, is giving us an imaginative language. And so he says, rise and go measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. Uh, he says, I want you to go and I want you to measure these uh, people, these items, the temple, the altar, um, and those who worship there. An interesting footnote, though, the word that's used for temple here 
is not the regular word that's used in the Greek Old Testament for the word temple. It's the word that's used, it's the Greek word that's used for like the holy of holies. Um, so for the intimate parts of the temple. Uh, so, so there are some who will say, well, he's told not to measure the whole temple, but measure the holy of holies, which is like the, the place where God dwells. Um, the altar, the, the, which would be the, the intimate place. But he's also told, don't go measure the court outside the temple. Now, for those of you that are familiar with your Old Testament and you're familiar with, um, I'm sure, I look around the room and I see the people on Zoom and I know that you probably have been going to Sunday school long enough or attending uh, Bible study long enough to where somewhere along the line someone has drawn you or shown you a picture of how the temple is laid out. And you know that the outermost court of the temple complex was called the the court of the Gentiles. Beyond that, Gentiles could go and they could worship in the court of the Gentiles, but they couldn't go inside the court of the Jews. Um, it seems like John is using the language of the whole temple, but here he is equating the court of the Gentiles, I believe, to um, referring to those who have not that are not a part of the church. Uh, think of Gentiles as, uh, as Rome, so to speak. Think of Gentiles as those who have not trusted Christ. And so he says, I've been giving a measuring rod to measure and look at the measurement of the temple, the altar, those who worship there. But I'm told, do not measure the, the court outside of the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations. And they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Now here's where we get our number Three and a half, or three and a half years, and we're going to see that in, in days in just a minute. Uh, and there are all kinds of speculation about the three and a half years. Now, I've already shared with you I don't believe in a seven-year tribulation. Uh, I, I don't believe in a rapture. I think a lot of what's being used here is all figurative language. John is writing for the imagination. He's not writing for us to interpret all these things literally. Uh, three and a half is, is a number of turmoil. It's the number of chaos. It's half the number of perfection. Uh, so it's not, it's not to represent uh, uh, a, a specific amount of time. I think it's, rep it's meant to say for a, a period of time, an indefinite period of time, that will be an indefinite period of time of turmoil, that the nations will rule. But by measuring the temple, uh, essentially I think it's a picture of the sealing of God's people again. Um, and so he's saying, look, those who are a part of me are still protected. Those who are not are left to, to cause chaos in the world. And let's be honest, the church in the first century is seeing that. They're living in, a, in, in the chaos of Roman rule. For them, the Gentiles, are, it's the Roman Empire. So as they're reading this for the first time, they're reading this and thinking, well, the Gentiles or the nations, that's Rome. And Rome is causing chaos and Rome, Rome is causing turmoil. We can't have jobs. We, are, we can't worship the way we want. We're uh, being threatened. Our livelihood is being threatened. Our lives are being threatened. So they see this time period of chaos and the number three and a half for them or the 42 months would be a symbol to them, an apocalyptic symbol to say, you know what, this is not always going to be the case. Rome is not always going to be the oppressor. Because we've been sealed by God and there is a hope in the future. And so here, I believe where we, where we have in this interlude, at, at the closing of the six trumpets, you've got people who, all these plagues happen, plagues on land, plagues from internal chaos, plagues, plagues from out, external uh, armies, all of that, and people still don't repent. And John is coming in and, he, he, and he's saying, hey, listen, there's no more warning. It's time to proclaim the message of God's judgment. The, the bitter, sweet message of God's judgment. God is going to protect his people in the midst of chaos. But then he's gonna conclude by saying, but don't worry, even in the midst of chaos, there will always be a witness for God. And that brings us to the, probably the more controversial or the, the more, uh, I won't say controversial, to me it's not controversial, it's more uh, different opinions about it. But uh, that brings us to verse 3. So let's pick up in verse 3. It says, And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, 
and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. And these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouths and consumes their foes. If any wood would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony... The beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from the peoples of the tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets have been tormented to those who dwell on the earth, have been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. And then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. This brings us to the fourth picture of these two interludes. So the first interlude is the interlude of the strong angel with the thunders and the little scroll. So you have the pictures of the seven thunders and the the scroll. Then in the second interlude, you have the story of the measuring of the temple, which leads to the two witnesses. And you have a reminder of God, in my opinion, God sealing his, his people even in the midst of turmoil, and that here with the two witnesses, you have a reminder that God's testimony, God, the proclamation of the gospel will continue. Now, let's talk about a couple of the opinions about the two witnesses. There are some who usually fall in the camp we would, would, might call dispensationalists, or sometimes they're just referred to as the futurists, that believe that these are real people, with divine protection, that God is going to send two real people right smack dab in the middle of a literal seven-year tribulation, um, and they're going to be witnesses um, during that time. Um, Some of them will go as far to say these will be Moses and Elijah sent down from heaven, and clearly the imagery uh, talks about Moses and Elijah, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, So there is that opinion that these are two literal witnesses, Moses and Elijah, who literally come back down to the earth, they testify, they are killed, they resurrect, and then they ascend. That's, that's uh, you know, they, they take this reading very literally. Um, you probably have figured out by now that that's not my approach to this text. I don't believe that we, we need to read this literally. It's imaginative. Um, another approach is referred to as the continuous historical approach. They look at the story of the two witnesses as a representation of a period that represents the apostasy of the church. So they essentially look at the book of Revelation and they try to fit the book of Revelation into periods of time within church history. And they see in the two witnesses a period of time between um, the apostolic age and the reformation really about the third century where the end of the apostolic age um, and the reformation and they see that that 
was a time where the church was its weakest, where the church seemed to fail. They particularly call out the Roman Catholic Church and say this is the time of the failing of the Roman Catholic Church. For them, they take it quite literally when they want to, um, and they say, well, it's 1,260 days, but remember, a day to the Lord is what? It's like a thousand years, you know, a, a thousand years a day. And so they want to take this as uh, a time period of years. And they say, you know, a year is like a day to the Lord. And so this represents around 1,300 years of, of uh, chaos between the third century and ultimately the, revelation, or the Reformation when Martin Luther um, not, you know, nailed the 95 Theses to the wall at Wittenberg. So... They see this as the two witnesses represent the true church during these dark times. That there was still, even in the midst of these dark times where the Roman Catholic Church was selling indulgences and and really um, bidding off grace to the highest bidder, they say there was a time in which the, the church was in its state of apostasy, but they were still faithful. There was still a faithful remnant. And so that's the continuous historical approach to this text. There are a bunch of other approaches. Um, But as you might um, expect of me, I think, again, we can read all of this within the picture of the imagination. I believe these two witnesses represent the church at various stages in, um, uh, in the life of the church. Look at how the story unfolds. So we start off, and you you get hints from Zechariah um, about the olive tree and the lampstands. John is always pulling imagery from the Old Testament. Sometimes it means uh, very different things, but he's always pulling those imageries and that language from the Old Testament. So you can uh, go to Zechariah, and you can see uh, the language of these uh, lampstands. You can see the language of uh, the olive tree. He says, These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouths and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. Who's that sound like? Sounds like Elijah, right? You go to Elijah's story. I mean, Elijah enters on the scene in uh, in the book of Kings, and he says, "Oh, great King Ahab, it's not going to rain." I mean, that's how he comes on the scene. He just comes on and says, "There's no kind of really introduction." He just shows up and says, "It's not going to rain." And next thing you know, he and Ahab and Jezebel all get into a spat, and Jezebel can't stand them, uh, and it's a big, uh, you know, chaos that ensues. But Elijah is more. Is, is more a representative character as well. I want you to picture Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Who does, who does he converse with on the Mount of Transfiguration? Elijah and Moses. Elijah is, is, a, is, is, is a representation of all of the prophets. He, he's a representative of the, of the prophets. Moses, as we see here, he, uh, it says... Um, They have the power to shut the sky so that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. That's Elijah. And the power over the waters and turn them into blood. Who's this? This is Moses. And strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And so you have Elijah and Moses represented here, um, seen kind of as these two witnesses. Um, Elijah and Moses, both represented on Mount of Transfiguration, representing, to me, the Mount of Transfiguration is a testimony that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the law and all of the prophets. Um, the, Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets. Uh, if you are familiar with the structure of the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Bible is divided up into three sections. You have the Torah, which is the law, Then you have the Nevi'im, 
which is the prophets, and then you have the ketuvim, which is the writings. So it's the law, the prophets, and the writings. So, uh, some people refer to the Hebrew uh, Bible as the Tanakh. They take the T from Tor, the N from Nevi'im, and the K from Ketuvim, and they put A's in it um, in between, and they make just a word that's the Tanakh. So if you ever see the word Tanakh, it represents the Hebrew Bible. Anyway, um, Jesus makes reference to the law and the prophets all the time um, in the New Testament. And so you have that representation there of Jesus being the fulfillment of the law and prophets. I think that here... um, the mentioning of the powers of Elijah and the mentioning of the powers of Moses are meant to conjure up images of Elijah and images of Moses. But I don't think we're meant to say that they are the ones that are here, but that they will have the power like the ones that are here. In other words, the authority of God to proclaim. What we have in verses four through six in these two witnesses is a period of powerful testimony. It's a period of testimony, almost militant testimony. I mean, it's like militant Christianity. Us versus them, it's like crusades. It's a picture of these two witnesses boldly proclaiming the gospel of Christ and anybody who tries to harm them, anyone who tries to hurt them is immediately put to shame, immediately uh, put down. So this this would be uh, the, the, the church when it is powerful in its testimony but the church doesn't always stay in moments of peak testimony we don't always stay in moments of high we're not always in the high of having fruitful and powerful testimony sometimes we're in the low and that's what's described next in verse 7 and when they have finished their testimony The beast that rises from the bottomless pit, going back to previous, uh, the abyss, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit, notice he calls him a beast this time, not an angel, but he will make war on them and conquer them and kill them and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt where their Lord was crucified for three and a half days. Some of these Uh, uh, Some from the peoples of the tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets have been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. And so they start off, these witnesses, with peak, powerful testimony. They're proclaiming the good news, and it seems like they're untouchable. Nobody can harm them. God is using them in a, in a, in a mighty way. And there are moments in the church where we have those kinds of, of testimony, where God brings about revival in the church, and great things are happening, and lives are being changed, and souls are being saved. But there are also times within the church, and the Roman uh, church, and I say Roman church, the churches of, of Asia that are under Roman rule right now, that John is writing to are in this time period of chaos and this time period of persecution and this time period where it feels like you've been defeated. I mean, if you read this, we're reading and we're saying, wow, look at these, these uh, witnesses. I believe the witnesses represent the church. And these witnesses are, are boldly proclaiming and Lives are being changed as souls are being saved and those who defy them have no power to stop the testimony of God. And then all of a sudden it seems like, it seems like evil wins and persecution wins and the witness is dead. And, you know, there's party in the streets. Oh, yeah, we don't have to deal with that anymore. They were a nuisance to us. And I'm sure, you know, this is, this is how the Christians in Rome are feeling and the Christians in Asia are feeling right now. Man, life is hard. We're losing our livelihood. We're losing our lives. And Rome has got its foot on our throat because we're not going to worship the emperor. This is where they are right now, feeling defeated. And so you have the moment of powerful testimony. You have the moment of seeming defeat where you think, we've lost. The testimony is gone. The church is dead. But then look what happens in verse 11. The world's celebrating. The world's rejoicing. Uh, These Christians, we don't have to worry about them. Yeah, they were a little bit of a nuisance, but we stopped that. We we put it, we we shut them up. We we 
persecuted them. We martyred them. We don't have to worry about the church anymore. But after the three and a half days, what is three and a half? It's a time of turmoil. It's an indefinite time of turmoil. After three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them. The picture of Genesis where the breath of life enters into man. And in Greek, the word pneuma can be translated as breath or spirit. So you have the breath of the spirit of God living in them again. And God entered them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. I mean, we live in a day where we don't really have to use our imagination because Hollywood is so good at painting pictures for us. But if you're reading this and you don't have the advantage of having seen a Hollywood film uh, and all you've had is imagery from other apocalyptic writings and you're, you're just kind of reading this story about God's people who have been killed and the world rejoicing and their bodies laying in a street where, I mean, their bodies laying in the street is, is, is a desecration uh, of their bodies. But all of a sudden, those bodies stand up again. I mean, that, that's, that, you, you're listening, because most of you can't read at the time, you're listening to someone read this to the church, and that gets your attention. The witness that was killed is alive again. What was laying in the street dead is now standing back up in the street. And he says, and the world watches. Great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell and 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to God of heaven. This is the church victorious and the church that has the promises of God on its side. You're, you're a Christian in Rome and you're facing the persecution and the problems that we read about in these seven churches. And you're wondering, man, how long can we go on with Rome putting its foot on our throat? How long can we go on with, with wondering whether we're going to be next, that, the next martyr for the church? And John writes to you and he gives you this narrative. And by now you've realized the point of the narrative. It's a story of God's sealing of his church and God's judgment on the world. It's a story of God's protection of his church and God's judgment of the world. Over and over and over again, different imagery. There's seals, there's trumpets, there'll be bowls, but it's always God's going to take care of his church. Though they may face trials and tribulations and turmoils, they will ultimately be victorious. And that's, that's what's happening with these witnesses. They're standing up, though they've been left for dead. They're standing up in the victory of God. And it's got the attention of the world. And it's got the attention of the world to the point where people are living now in fear. The question is, is this fear, does it lead to revival? Some say yes, some say no. I mean, look at how it, the uh, section ends in verse 13. 7,000 people were killed in an earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Does giving glory to the God of heaven mean that they repent of their sins and they trust Jesus Christ and say, whoa, whoa, we're so sorry, we need Jesus in our life? Or does it simply mean, oh, they recognize this is the God of heaven and woe is me. I think it's the latter. And of course, we have verse 14. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is to come. Now, I'm going to tell you, John's not going to tell us when that third woe is. This is the last time we're going to hear. He's never going to say, oh, now we're at the third woe. Um, but he's warned us about three woes where we had um, 
in verse 13 of chapter 8, I looked and I heard an eagle, an eagle crying out with a loud voice as it flew directly over. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth and blast of the other trumpets that the three angels blow. So you have that, um, that declaration of three woes. And then you have the first woe happening in verse 12 of chapter 9. Then you have the second woe of chapter 11, verse 14. And then we're going to have the blowing of the fifth or of the uh, seventh trumpet. And we're going to get a different picture. Um, is the blowing of the seventh trumpet the third woe? We don't know. Um, John moves on. But again, this is not a problem for us because we're reading it with our imagination. We're getting a picture of, of John, e- good versus evil. Um, you know, the story is going to continue to unfold, the same story that we've been reading, but the imagery is going to get much, much richer. If, if that were even possible, uh, you know, uh, it does. It gets much richer. We're going to have a woman and a dragon and just picture of kind of what happens at Bethlehem, all of this great imagery um, that John is going to use. But all of it paints the same story. And I'll go ahead and ruin the rest of the book for you. The church will struggle. There will be trials and tribulation. But God will protect and seal his church. And he will redeem his church and he will save his church. And he will bring his church into his kingdom. So that's, that's the promise that the book of Revelation is giving us. That no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through, God, we are to continue to be a witness. We are continue to proclaim. You know, in the times of powerful testimony and in the times of seemingly death, seeming death, we continue to witness. Because our promise is that we will be with God one day. And so that's the story of the book of Revelation. So any questions or comments? I know we kind of went through a lot of this and uh, did not go into every little detail. Um, but I, I want you to, again, get an overall picture. Um, we're not trying to map all these things and put these on a chart and a timeline. What we're trying to do is say, what does this mean to the first century? The first readers. Because what it meant to them is what it means to us today. Though we live in a different context, what it meant to them is, and the encouragement it was to them is the way it encourages us. If all of the events that are described here weren't going to happen for another 2,000 years, then there's no encouragement for the church in the first century. But if John is describing events that they're facing today and that we face today, then it's an encouragement that transcends just the first century. It, it transcends and speaks to us as well. And I think that's what John was doing, is encouraging the first century church and in doing so, encouraging the 21st century church. So any questions or comments as we dismiss?